All our needs are met. 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 Now I won't feel like I have to do anything. <laughs> okay, so that's I'm gonna ask you to come in at the end for me doing that, okay? We had our rehearsal, let's go on tour. <laughs> Sometimes I forget that all my needs are met. And now and then I fall asleep, I think in things I don't believe until I wake up in gratefulness, counting all the ways I'm blessed that all my needs are met. You can clap, please do. There was a time I recall when I couldn't see the light of day. Somehow spirit, sweet spirit, made a way out of no way. Uh, that is why I testify, no matter how dark it gets, that all our needs are met.
I just, a few things. I have to just comment. I hadn't heard that, that book by Bo Lazoff in so long. We're all doing time. Bo Lazoff had a prison ministry. And uh, he was working with people in prison. And he noticed that, that the people in prison were dealing with the same issues as the people in Beverly Hills. We're all doing time. We're all just trying to get through. So thank you for bringing that up because he was a really good friend of mine. And... Um, Oh, and even the things you don't know about. There's a prayer that when we start to really surrender our life and we offer it up, which I talked about about two weeks ago, when it's like there's this thing where you let spirit move, move, you consciously allow the presence of God to move through you so deeply that things get healed that you didn't even know needed to be healed. Things get revealed that you didn't know needed to be revealed. And things get lifted up that you think, wow, who knew? It could be that good. That's, the, that's basically been the, the focus of my talks so far this fall, is to have a God-centered life so that God is our center. And the center for spiritual living is just a blah, blah, blah. And it's not just this place. It's a way of living that we're centered in spirit. And that we start to live from spirit. Oh, there's... Uh, Patrick will help you because we got a place for you. Yes. If you want it. So you can be really comfortable. So anyway, I'm, this is all winding down. And my intention for all of these talks was that you do well. And that you do well, so well, that you overflow that wellness over to your family and your friends and your community. That, that, that you just know who you are, that all your needs are met, and that you are an epicenter of that so other people start to feel it too. Because there is a sin going on in this country, brothers and sisters, and that sin is the belief in scarcity. And the belief in scarcity causes people to do really weird things that are not good for society. So the more people can heal their sense of scarcity, the more that that can become the epidemic. Because what's the epidemic now is scarcity, and therefore I have to do anything I can. And we get, we get crazy. And, and um, when I say we, I mean as a culture. And it's crazy making. And people become very unskilled in social behaviors. So my talks have been centering around you connecting to your, the God of your being, which is the source of your supply, or when I say supply, it's the source of all your good stuff, and it's like mental, spiritual, emotional, material, opportunities. So, now what? Now, what do we do to move into that? Well, um, the talk today is actually the answer, it kind of. Um, because I wanted to talk about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And there is something that actually fits all of those definitions, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and that's this thing called commitment. I heard the rumble. Well, as a recovering commitment phobe, I can talk about this. You know, I've been in recovery for about 25 years from commitment phobia. Now, even the word commitment can be scary, so here's, let's just go start with ugly. Let's start with the word ugly, ugly definition of commitment. Commitment, a definition, a definition of commitment is to be consigned to a penal or mental institution. Now, that's pretty damn ugly. There's another definition, which is a bad definition, which is obligated or impelled. How many of you feel obligated and love it? You know, nobody likes to be impelled, nobody likes to feel obligated. It's a really bad definition. It's a bad feeling. It's a bad expression of this thing called commitment. The other good definition of commitment is to promise to do something. A good commitment can only be given by a free person, so it doesn't obligate you because you were free to commit. You're not, con you're not confined in any way. And, and what I've noticed is when I'm willing to make a commitment, there is a blessing in the commitment. When Two people decide to be together and they commit to each other. That commitment blesses both of them. That, 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 there's something that, that something that comes together when the two become one. That the commitment is 
the holy idea, the immaculate conception of something that can feed them both. It's really beautiful. And, um, and powerful. So how many of you would like to have a good experience of commitment? Great. Stay with me. Are you committed to having a good experience of commitment? Yeah, oh yeah, no, less people raise their hand. It's like, hmm, tell me everything. Tell me everything. See, this is, no, commitment's made, and then you just get to discover. It's a discovery. How many of you have ever fallen in love and then kept discovering things about them? And yet, it's the commitment that allows you to move through that discovery. It's very powerful, but by the way. All right, so... I want to share with you some things that I think we should be committed to if we want to thrive. Because this whole season's been about thriving, and here's some things to be committed to if you want to thrive. First off, first off forgiveness. Commit to forgiveness. Commit to forgiveness. Not because you want to, not because you feel like it, but because you said, I will forgive. I will forgive. The Master Jesus said that we should be forgiving 70 times 7, and there's a lot of definitions about that and a lot of things about that. But uh, it's also an Aramaic idiom, kind of like, you know, shut the front door, you know. <laughs> that was Jesus' shut the front door. <laughs> How many times should I forgive? 70 times 7. It meant as long as it takes. You forgive to as long as it takes. You forgive until you think of that person and there's no... Eh! There's no... Eh! Why do you do it? So that you can become a clear place through which the divine can flow because if your heart is closed and a lot of that good, that bottled up good, that, that source of all goodness flows through our being and if we've got a closed heart, it's very hard to flow through. One of the best books, but don't read it because it's weird, um, <laughs> on prosperity, now you're going to go get it, uh, uh, one of the best books on prosperity was, was, uh, was written by Charles Fillmore, and it's just called Prosperity, and there is a whole chapter in there about forgiveness. Forgive, 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 so that God can give forth through you. You give that up. Just give it up. Give up the story. Give up the resentment. And that's difficult. And that's why you offer it up. Father, Mother, God within, I don't know how to forgive. These guys were jerks. Father, Mother, God within, I don't know how to forgive. That guy is a jerk. And, and, it's, and, and let me give you the reasons. So go ahead. You know, God is always giving, always giving. It gives to everyone. And some can accept and some can't. And I'm here to be your cheerleader for acceptance. And one of the ways to accept more good in your life is to forgive others. Get your heart clean. Clean. When Jesus was up on the cross, according to the story, and the story was meant to, to convey an idea. I'm not sure it was literal. But the idea of the first, what we would call Christians, but they'd never call themselves Christians. They called them followers of the way. More, they were more like um, Jewish Taoists. And the way was... Forgive, forgive, forgive. So it, it, it's inserted into the stories. But up on the cross, Jesus said, forgive them. They know not what they do. And people who are idiots don't know what they're doing. People who are mean to others don't know that it's going to come back to them, multiplied, pressed down, and running over. People who are stingy don't know that God is their source. People who have been wounded will wound others and they don't even know that they're doing it because it was done to them. They don't know how to break the cycle. So break the cycle. Who wants to be here and break the cycle of really bad behavior? Then commit to forgiving. Otherwise, you'll be triggered and you will do something that you wish you hadn't. 
An unforgiving heart is easily triggered. And while you're forgiving, forgive yourself. Something I put on my Facebook page uh, last week is that we need to forgive our younger self when we were ignorant. How many of you are grateful you grew out of some of those things? <laughs> Praise God! <laughs> forgive. Commit to forgiving. Commit to praying for your enemies. Take a deep breath. <laughs> Who are your enemies? <sighs> Anyone that you're out of sync with. It could just be that you just know that you're better than them. <laughs> you're much more woke. <laughs> or it could be that you just are so politically opposed to them. As Jesus said it, anybody, anybody can pray for their family and friends. Big whoop. He didn't say big whoop, but he meant big whoop. Pray for those that you have conflicts with, whether it's spoken, unspoken, or just under the current. People, oh, by the way, if any of you have problems with me, pray for me. I will accept. <laughs> Maybe I'm here to bless you by making you pray for me. <laughs> I have a list that every time I think of somebody that I, I am out of sync with, I put him on my prayer list in the morning, and I'm praying for him. I do. He's like, T -t 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 -t. okay, here. God bless them. God bless them. I've said this story before, but I'll say it again. There was a time when I was really having a, a problem with my boss. I mean, I was, I was young. I was maybe 19, but I was a good born-again Christian. And... Uh, I didn't know what to do. I, I was out of my league. I had no idea how to handle it. We were so at odds. So I went to my car during my break, my 15-minute break, and I just said, God, I can't stand it. I hate that man. Well, I actually didn't call it God because I was good, born again Christian, so it's Jesus, and Jesus was in the back seat. I knew. <laughs> and I said, Jesus, I hate that man. But you probably don't. Ah. Uh. So you bless them. I can't bless them. I hate them, but you bless them. Go ahead, you bless them. I almost challenged Jesus to bless the idiot. I went back after my 15-minute break, and he came over. He, he was there, and he said, Kathy Ann. No, he, I was then Kathy. We didn't. My name's Kathy Ann, but I went by Kathy. You know, it's cuter. <laughs> Kathy, I need to talk to you. I don't know why I've been so on your case. I really apologize for the way I've been treating you. Anyway, I'm a believer. Pray for those people that you're out of sync with. There was a politician that I didn't like. <laughs> But here's, it's not about that. It's about, I had to commit to blessing that person because that's my faith. I didn't want to. And then I got to see that a lot of the things that I judged that person for, they were in me only latent. They were in me and I wasn't expressing them. So, so, I also got to heal myself a lot, in myself, I got to heal a lot of stuff that I didn't like about myself. Who's willing to be committed to blessing your enemies? Yeah, not 100%, but we're moving there. <laughs> Number three, you get to commit to show up and serve. There's, there's a difference between showing up and showing up in service. So if we have a job, we show up and we do the job. But do we do it as service? If we have a friend, do we show up and serve them? Or do we just show up? If we have a partner, do we show up to serve them, to, to, to give of ourselves to them and to that moment, to express love, or are we just showing up? Do you see the difference? See, supply, 
which means the source of all good things. The source of all good things in metaphysics, metaphysics would be called supply. And supply is a natural state within us, just like love is a natural state within us. Just like peace is a natural state within us. Joy is a natural state within us. We don't have to pray for things to bring it to us. We don't pray for things to ignite, us in, ignite it in us, all those things, especially for supply. We start to express, and then that expression fills us and then brings more to us. So as we show up, and, and, and give of our forgiveness and give of our blessings and prayers and give of our service, we open up a way through which the divine support of the universe can show up in us and in our life. Don't wait to feel better. Because you're waiting to feel better it, in it's consciousness is caused, which is the bottom line for metaphysical teachings. If the consciousness is caused and we're waiting, we're saying we don't have. And thus, that wonderful statement from Jesus, for those who have not, even that will shall be taken. If you don't have it in consciousness, you're not going to have it. So you show up to serve. And it's, it's just a slight shift in attention. It's not like you do more. It's not like you become codependent. It's not like you, uh, you work overtime for no pay. It's that when you're there, you're really invested in giving the best of yourself to whatever is before you. The, th the next thing to be uh, committed to is gratitude. Gratitude. Gratitude before me, all around me. Be committed to finding those things that you are grateful for and thankful for. In all, in all things, give thanks. If you look at some of the miracles that Jesus worked in the story that was told, because the stories were told to show forth a way, and no one was taking dictation. Most people weren't literate. And besides that, how could they write fast enough? But the stories that were told, and they were told decades after Jesus was gone, the stories were told to tell of a way of life. And so many of those stories involved Jesus doing miracles. But in the miracle, he was always giving thanks. I give thanks to that, that you have heard me. It's just this, you know, looking up and giving thanks show up in a lot of those miracle stories. And that's why I said at the very beginning of this service, it's not just give thanks because it's all going well, because, but that is a beginning, because we go unconscious to it. And that's not, don't make yourself wrong there. What, what I know about human beings is that we have evolved because we are really good problem solvers, so we know how to pick out a problem. That's how we evolved. But a problem means something to fix. This, that's a human trait. It's a spiritual trait to give thanks. According to the Bible, the angels are always praising and thanking the universal spirit. That's our spiritual nature. And when we start to do that, we raise up in our own spiritual nature. How many of you are committed to being more grateful? Oh, many more people. Well, okay, here's the tough one. But I'm so grateful. grateful. You know, this gets me back to my old sales days. You start out with some yeses before the big no. <laughs> the next thing is you commit to giving to the source of your spiritual support and you make a commitment to do that whether you think you can or not. It's about putting God first in your life. In a, a Judeo-Christian tradition, it's called tithing. 
Let me read from Joel Goldsmith. How many of you have heard Joel Goldsmith? A few of you. Well, he was a Christian mystic, Christian New Thought mystic. I don't know what he'd call himself, but man, he was a mystic. What he said was, years ago, gratitude was expressed by tithing to the church. When tithing is expression of gratitude for, for, its, for its contribution, it is a blessing to both the giver and the receiver. However, eventually, some shrewd individuals figured out that by giving 10%, they'd get 90% return, and tithing became a percentage deal. Because of this, it lost its effectiveness. If you give just to get, it's a game. If you give out of gratitude, it's a spiritual principle. Prithing, tithing when practiced as the way the master taught it is a joy, a pleasure, a privilege to those who have rediscovered it. And um, those who tithe uh, with gratitude as their only motivation discover that there is indeed a father who revo- rewards them openly. I think it was in the Old Testament. It says, bring forth the tithes into my, where, my storehouse and I will pour you out a blessing too great to... To, uh, for you, too great for you to hold. So I know that Ev is doing well in de- Ev tithes. Kathy Lindsay does really well, and she tithes. But they tithed before they did really well. See, some people will want to do well, and then I will. This is like, as long as my partner stays really good and really nice and does everything I want and never puts the towel on the bathroom floor again, I will be committed. No, commitment's commitment. And you don't have to because here's the deal. God is always giving. God is always giving. You don't get God's approval because of what you give. You open up a way through God to give through you by how you give. By how you give. Not only what you give, but how you give. Do you give it with an open heart and going, praise God, look what I have. I am so grateful. I received this message, and I am being filled up, and I will give again, not only because it is a spiritual practice. That's the way I want to teach it. You know, I, 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 someone actually said to me, you know, times are hard. We shouldn't probably be talking about giving too much. I said, no, it's a spiritual practice. I started this spiritual practice when things were very hard for me, when I would not have eaten if I didn't have grandparents who hunted and had venison in the freezer and who would kill a calf or a, a cow every day, uh, every year, and, and give the meat to the family, I, and, and had a garden and, and canned goods, I wouldn't have eaten well. I didn't start when things got good. I started and then things got good. And I want to shout that. Uh, that's a testimony, brothers and sisters. Now, you can choose to do it or not because you're good no matter what you do. And you're... So this is not about being better. This is about being open, so better can flow. Now think on that. I'll be back.